want to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people and paying my respects to their elders, past and present. It's so important to acknowledge and remember the Aboriginal history of this land. It gives us hope because we know that we can manage this country sustainably because it was done for 60,000 years or more. So if it's been done in the past, we can do it again. We can get to a place where we manage our land, our country, our water, our food sustainably. So thinking about history is important and thinking about our own history is important too. Thinking about the stories that we all have, everyone in this room has a unique life story and a set of experiences that you draw on when you think about the contribution that you're going to make to solving climate change and that you're already making. And we should reflect on that history too. So I want you to close your eyes just for a minute and think back to when you were 10 years old. You probably had a pretty strong sense of purpose. Back in you were 10, before you got distracted by thinking about what everyone else expected you to do with your life, before you got caught up in thinking about what you wanted to do to impress that hot person. You probably had a pretty strong sense of right and wrong. You can open your eyes now. I was talking to my mum this morning and when she was 10, she was growing up in a little community in the Hunter Valley, which is in New South Wales, and she was born on a dairy farm, went to a little school called Ruffett Primary, 30 kids in the whole school. Their playground was a paddock. And coal mines started to encroach on that area. And soon enough, that town, those towns around her community, around Singleton, a lot of them had disappeared. The mining companies bought up the houses, the people left, a lot of farmers moved away. Her family moved up to northwestern New South Wales and became cattle farmers instead of dairy farmers. And she says, you know, looking back then, we didn't realise, but the government of New South Wales was selling people for coal. And I think back to when I was 10 and, and I started to understand climate change around that age because we learned about it in school, right? We learned about the greenhouse effect. And I kind of got what was happening because I saw what was going on and what was affecting my family's farms in northwestern New South Wales, my uncle's farm, the droughts, the floods, my grandparents' farm, watching other people lose their, their land seeing the stories of farmers committing suicide, of communities being ripped apart and realising that climate change was not just about polar bears, this was about our future viability, our food security, our water security and that it was going to have to be up to us. We couldn't rely on governments and business to fix this one for us. So I, I was kind of thinking all this stuff and then I waited four years until I was 14 and decided it was time to do something about it. And I set up a group in my school and I had no special skills. I was the world's most ordinary kid. I'm still pretty ordinary. You don't need anything other than what you've already got to make an impact on this issue. And I was really lucky because I guess it was through winning a campaign back then. I was involved in a community campaign where we stopped a new mine, a new mine that BHP, one of the world's biggest mining companies, wanted to build 40 minutes north of our school. And working with the traditional owners, with the Waramai people, with the local environment group, with a group of residents, we stopped it. And it taught us all that change comes in this country from the bottom up, not the top down. And so I was lucky because I figured out early on that that was my purpose, that I wanted to do something on climate change. And there was a lot of things that I didn't figure out back then and that I'm still figuring out today, but I did figure that out. And Having that understanding led me to be able to do things that I never had imagined back then would have been possible. And it's funny being here today because eight years ago at Monash University, there were a group of students who were very active running a clean energy on campus campaign. And they had a huge win. They held a student referendum where young people at this university voted on what they wanted the university to do on climate change. And they had a, a lot of success. The university invested more in energy efficiency. They, they cut uh, 
at the moment, at, before they started the campaign, most of their energy was coming from coal and they decided to purchase more renewable energy. They invested money in a sustainability team. All of these things happened because a group of students stood up at their own campus and said, let's change this. And there was a conference eight years ago here at Monash University, and it was a lot smaller than the number of people here today, but there was a conference of students who started to, to talk about what we could do to build a broader movement on climate change. Now, at the end of that year, I was in Montreal. I was over there for the UN climate change talks, and AYCC didn't exist, but there were students and young people who were taking action on their own campuses. And I met all of these other young people from around the world who were doing really similar things. And I realized, actually, this, this is a global movement of young people who maybe weren't as connected as we, we should have been. And we came together at a conference in the snow, ironically, given we were talking about climate change. But it made me realize that if we had this potential growing movement of youth and all of the power that that could, could bring about when it comes to solving climate change, we had to do something with it and we couldn't wait. We couldn't wait until we'd grown up and got serious jobs and, and only then could we do something. There's this narrative in, in a society, particularly in Australia, that you go to primary school, you go to high school, you go to university, you do your honours, you get a job and maybe then you can make a difference. That is bullshit. That's not how the world works. We have to act now. We can't wait until we're CEOs or until we've got a lot of money. Now is the time that we need to act. And so back then I thought I was going to become a lawyer. I was almost at the end of my law degree. But in Montreal I decided that I couldn't do that because we aren't living in a situation that's business as usual. And so we can't really be planning careers in a business as usual way that planning your life as if climate change isn't happening and as if we're not part of the last generation that has the ability to solve it, that's a failure of imagination. We can think bigger, we can dream bigger, and we can be braver. And so that's how that idea of AYCC came about, meeting all of those other young people from around the world who were acting on climate change and starting to set up similar things. And some of them had chosen to be activists in a country where being an activist meant they couldn't live a normal life they were facing the threat of being beaten or imprisoned. But they did it because for many of them, they had no choice. They were in countries who were already experiencing severe impacts of climate change. Everything was at stake for them. And so when the stakes are high, you take bigger risks. And people said at the start, well, why are you setting up a youth climate coalition when there are already so many climate change organisations and environment organisations? And we said to them, the generation most affected by the climate crisis must be front and centre of solving it. That is how we win. And I still believe that, especially when I've been able to see over the past eight years everything that, that you guys have done, that AYCC has done. Because don't let anyone ever tell you that you're the leaders of tomorrow. You're the leaders of today. And leadership is not about who you are, it's about what you do. What you do every day is what makes you who you are. This is not a dress rehearsal. We don't get another chance at this. You've heard about the science, you've heard about how urgent it is. We've got to do everything we can now. And there's no such thing as being too young or too idealistic. If people ever tell you that, you tell them about Martin Luther King, who was only 25 years old when he told America that he had a dream. And he was working for years and years before that on the civil rights movement. And you can tell them about Mahatma Gandhi, who was 24 when he got involved in the anti-colonisation movement. And you can tell them about, some of you will know this story because I think it's so amazing, you can tell them about what happened in 1836 when a young woman called Harriet Hansen led a group of women and girls out of a textile mill in northern Massachusetts on strike for better conditions and higher wages, and she was 11 years old. So if anyone ever says you're too idealistic or too young, remind them of Harriet Hansen and remind them that now is the time that we have to step up. And remind them of the people that we have in our own movement right now who are doing exactly that, and that people are going to be making speeches about 100 years from now.
Some of you will have read in the news about a friend of mine who's also from the Hunter Valley, Jonathan Moylan. So at the start of the year, for those of you who hadn't seen in the news, Jono sent out a fake press release that activists have done for, for, for generations. It's been a tool in the activist toolbox to send out a fake press release with some fake good news announcing that ANZ Bank wasn't going to be investing or would withdraw its investment in the Malls Creek mine, which threatens farmland near my grandparents' hometown now of Gunnedah in northwestern New South Wales, Liverpool Plains, some of the most productive farming country in Australia under threat from coal and coal seam gas. And Jono sent out this fake press release. Journalists believed it. And it's something that activists have done for a long time. But he is now facing, he's been charged by ASIC. He's facing fines of almost half a million dollars and potentially up to 10 years in jail. Jono's 25 years old. He is one of us. And he's standing up for our generation and for future generations. And when fossil fuel industries see people doing brave things like that, they try and do everything they can to take their power away. And I think also about another brave young man that I know, Tim DeChristopher, who just a few months ago finished serving a 21-month jail sentence. He was a student at Utah. After he finished his exams one day, he went down and there was a protest outside uh, an auction that the Bush administration was holding in the last few days of the Bush administration, later found to be in an illegal auction, uh, auctioning off parcels of land for oil and gas extraction. Tim was asked if he wanted to bid. He said, OK. He went inside. He made bids of, of I think, up to $2 million before they realised he wasn't really a bidder. <laughs> he went to jail for 21 months for that. And I spoke to him before he went in, and I've spoken to him after he's been out, and he is still just as involved in the climate movement as he was beforehand. And as Bill McKibben said, going to jail is not the end of the world. The end of the world is the end of the world. When Tim spoke at Power Shift before he went to jail, he said, when will we decide that stopping this injustice is more important than me graduating on time? When will we decide that stopping this injustice is more important than my career plans? And speaking of career plans, there are a lot of people in this room who've made sacrifices for this movement, but one of them I just want to mention is a young man called Pat Harps, who used to be a chemical engineer at, at, in Melbourne, here in Melbourne, with Exxon, with ExxonMobil. And as he came to understand climate change, he realised that his career wasn't compatible with that knowledge, and he left. And his resignation letter is one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen. And I'm not saying that you have to quit your job or go to jail to solve climate change, but I am saying be as brave as you can be and figure out what is the most strategic and the most important thing that you can do, given your context and your knowledge and your own story. And sometimes it'll be hard work and, well, pretty much all the time it'll be hard work. <laughs> you know, right now I'm spending pretty much every day knocking on doors in Canberra as part of a Senate race that could stop Tony Abbott getting control of both Houses of Parliament. And it's hard work and, yeah, it's really important. You guys should all come. <laughs> you never know what you're going to be doing to solve climate change. You could be knocking on doors, you could be going to jail, you could be moving to far north Queensland to stop the, the coal and coal seam gas expansion up there. Or you could be working in your school or your community or your university to reduce carbon pollution there. There are so many things you can do, but, but please don't take the business as usual path. That's just the main message that I hope you get from Power Shift, that our world is changing really quickly, and we have to be brave if we're going to save it. And so I'm not a student anymore, but I do teach a course at ANU of amazing young students who are not waiting until they graduate to make a difference. And one of my students explained to the class at the end of semester a few weeks ago that she judges her actions with the following question. What would a 10-year-old me have thought of my actions? And she said, if you can't justify it to your 10-year-old self, then it's probably not justifiable. And that's why we have to fight. You know, we don't know if we're going to win this. The odds are against us. But what power shift is about, what this movement is about, is about changing those odds doing everything we can to change those odds. And we don't know if we can win, but we know it's damn well important enough for us to try our best. 
So to finish up, I want you to just keep that image of your 10-year-old self in your mind. We owe it to that 10-year-old idealistic sense of purpose that we had back then, and we owe it to all the future 10-year-olds that haven't even been born yet to try as hard as we can to solve climate change. Thank you.